Okay, so let's get started. Welcome everyone to the first day of this iPythoner workshop. We start today with Yoni Khan from University of University of Sylvana Champagne. He's going to talk about uncertainty quantification from your nectar storage in batch. And yeah, please. Thanks much. Can everyone hear me? Um, okay, so um, I thought that I would start with an XKD cartoon as all good talks should. Um, so this is a talk that is more about using physics to understand machine learning, and then maybe once we can turn that around to use machine learning to do better physics. So I think a lot of the talk that I heard yesterday were about applying really amazing and cutting edge tools of machine learning to solve really difficult physics problems. Um, I am relatively new to this field, and I frankly sometimes feel a bit overwhelmed by just the the scope of all the tools that we can use. And so the goal of this talk is to try to pare everything down to the kind of very simplest version of what we might mean by machine learning, maybe one step beyond linear regression, um, and try to really understand how it works so that we don't have to go through the conversation these guys do. So one guy says, this is your machine learning system. This guy says, yep, you just pour the data into this big pile of linear algorithm and collect the answers on the other side. What if the answers are wrong? Just stir the pile until they start looking right. Um, so we're scientists, we can do better than that. Um, and in particular, I think kind of what this gets at is like there's a lot of arbitrary choices that one has to make when picking a machine learning tool. And as I'll emphasize, you know, one way to think about uncertainty quantification is like whatever answers we get should be robust to as many of those choices as possible. Um, okay, so this is the hard problem of, of machine learning theory. And so there's some hard sub problems that people have identified. And so one of them is like, okay, you train a neural network. So like what actually happens during training? Um, so just as you know, a stupid example, you can initialize some fully connected network. You can make a histogram of the parameters that you start with. Then you can make a histogram of the parameters you end with. Look, those distributions are different. Something happens. But then, you know, by some magic that's not just linear regression, um, it manages to go from calling this thing a two to calling this thing a nine, which is, you know, from incorrect to correct. So the dynamics of trading I find are interesting because they resemble in many ways physical systems that we're interested in. And so we can use tools from physics to try to understand of how this works. Um, there's another hard sub problem that um, is really driving a lot of the progress in industry these days. Um, so you've heard the phrase a picture is worth a thousand words, but in this case, it's the power law that's worth a billion dollars. So if you haven't heard this story, let me try to show you how this works. Um, so some ex-physicist, or one person who I guess still is not really a physicist, had the brilliant idea of plotting things on a log log plot. Um, what if we plotted the training set size or the, the, the test lots as a function of training set size for you know one of these language models on a long line plot? Huh, that looks like a straight line. We see power laws all the time. What if we just extrapolate this? I wonder what happens. Um, and so that's actually what OpenAI did. So this is from their blog post. Okay, they like curves. This is on a you know a long linear plot. But what you see is they did these experiments and they're like, we think we're gonna end up here in the loss when we scale our model up by some amount of compute parameters. Well, um, data, whatever you want. And lo and behold, they landed pretty close. Um, and the reason this is worth a billion dollars is that every one of these training runs costs millions or tens of millions of dollars of compute power. And so if you can predict where you're going to land, even if you're not really sure why these power laws exist, you can save a whole lot of money. Um, and the really impressive and interesting thing that kind of begs explanation is these power laws show up everywhere in machine learning. Um, and so if we can understand where they come from, and in particular, if we can understand how we change the slope, then all of a sudden you can make all of your training more efficient. And then, you know, we get those what some features yesterday we were talking about. You can do, you know, cutting edge machine learning on your laptop. That's kind of the hope. Okay. Um, and so what I'll focus on today, and, you know, maybe this is a bit of an idiosyncratic point of view, um, but it's, you know, if you're trying to do machine learning in physics, um, every time you train a neural network, that's just one representative draw from an ensemble of all the neural networks you could have got. And at the very least, when you fill your network with random parameters at the beginning, that's a random drop of some distribution. What if you started someplace else? You know, so what my student Hannah Day and I did um, in, in the paper here, you know, among other things, is we looked at if you train an ensemble of networks, then you get some average loss over that ensemble, but then you get some error bars. What sets the size of the error bars? That's kind of a question that one doesn't have to ask chat GPT, like you know, you type in a prompt that gives you an answer, you're not really so interested in the spread of the posterior, you know, you just kind of want to know, kind of like write your college essay for you. But in physics, if you want to quantify errors, it really helps understand, at the very least, where are these error bars inherited from your initialization variance coming from? 
And can we make them smaller than all the other sources of uncertainty in the problem? The kind of stuff that Chris Don was talking about yesterday. In astrophysics analysis, you have uncertainty all over the place. You don't want your dominant uncertainty uncertainty to be the one coming from your arbitrary choices you made in order to do your machine learning analysis. Um, and if we're able to answer these first two questions, then you know maybe if we can understand the size of these error bars, then we don't need to do these enormous hyperparameter scans in order to make sure that we're doing the absolute best arbitrary choice. Um, we can figure out ahead of time with some less compute uh, how to actually um, you know make, make a network that has um, uh, the smallest uncertainties that we can get. Okay, um, so that's kind of the, the perspective of the talk. So here's a cartoon of the kind of plots that I'll show you. So you have some task, it really doesn't matter what it is. Um, there's some way of measuring how well you do, which is which is the loss function. Maybe that would represent the error in some regression problem, so the, you know, the amount that you're off by. So if the error is zero, you get the right answer. So you can think of this as a bias away from, um, from, the, true, uh, from the true answer. And then as you increase the training set size, you should do better and better, your loss should go down. But when you initialize your network by drawing from some distribution of parameters, every initialization gives you a slightly different answer. So there's always going to be some variance here. Um, and if you're in this limit over here, where the size of the variance is comparable to your error, um, then it really doesn't make sense to say that you're doing as well as the mean here. You really need to be saying your systematic uncertainty is driven by the size of the error bar. Um, so what I want to know is, can we exploit the existence of these scaling laws to tell you how big a training set you need to end up in this regime, at which point your systematic uncertainty you assign to the size of the error bar because it kind of doesn't matter how much the mean goes down because your the variance of your network is always um, uh, going to be the dominant part. Okay, um, so this is my perspective on uncertainty quantification, and um, so uh, maybe just to, to put it a little bit lightly, every paper has kind of a neural network map those paragraphs, right? So we use a Fancy architecture network with cool acronym optimizer and then random integer one layers of width random integer two and impress assigning function learning rate schedule and a number of scientific notation FX of training. Right? So I like we can all agree there's lots of arbitrary choices here. Um, and maybe those don't matter, and indeed they shouldn't matter. Um, and I'd like to understand to what extent our results can be robust against all of these choices. Um, I should say, by the way, um, I'm happy to take questions during the talk. So uh, uh, I, I noticed yesterday there's kind of a lot of like waiting for questions at the end, but I think this is a workshop, so so back and forth is totally fine. So feel free to stop me if you have questions. Okay. Um, all right. So so what's the setup? The setup is going to be a fully connected MLP trained with full batch gradient design. Um, so this is basically just a slide to set up the location. So why? It's because in this setup, the only source of randomness is your initializations. You draw your weights from a normal distribution with that which has with this. Why? So this thing has a nice scaling in the limit where the number of neurons per layer goes to infinity. Um, and so if you're using full batch gradient descent, now there's no randomness associated with how you pick each mini batch. And I'm imagining for the first part of the talk, the data set is fixed. So there's no variance in different drops in your data distribution. And so the statistics of your ensemble of neural networks are driven entirely by the statistics of your initialization choices. Um, okay. And, and right. So the, the training step, we're going to scale the learning rates for the weights and biases differently um, and um, for, for, for reasons I'll get into later. And we're going to choose activation functions that are smooth, um, also for, for, uh, for reasons I'll get into later. Okay, um, so this is a nice playground because it's been known actually for now several decades that there is a nice limit that physicists can understand very well. So if you take a fully connected network and you take the number of neurons per layer to infinity, then the statistics become Gaussian by some rough application of the central limit theorem. So what do I mean by that? I mean that if you ask what is the output of the network given a certain data set, that output is always going to be a Gaussian process, and it's going to have some kernel that at least in the uh, first layer depends on basically just dot product of the input. Um, so Gaussian distributions are nice. We know how to compute all the moments. Every physics problem, as Sidney Coleman said, you know, is increasingly sophisticated applications of, uh, um, uh, of the harmonic oscillator, which is just the, the, the Gaussian integrals. Um, but what's also nice is that not only do you know where you start, you know where you end up. Um, so if you train this network with, with full batch gradient descent, I know what the mean prediction of the network is just as a function of this object called the neural tangent kernel that depends on some derivatives of the network with respect to its parameters that I can compute at initialization. So given where I start, I know exactly where I end up. It's just a linear algebra problem that involves inverting this matrix. 
And then the predictions that I get are linear in the training labels that I give um, the, the supervisor of the um, So that's a useful limit because you can compute lots of things. Um, it's not realistic in several ways. And one of them is that there's no so-called feature learning. So this matrix never evolves as you train. So it never learns important features from the data. Um, there are ways of uh, restoring feature learning in the large end limit that I, that I won't talk about. Um, but it's a nice starting point because you can start to do perturbation theory in the number of neurons per layer that I'll talk about in a little bit. And that's kind of where the physics uh, perspective comes in. Okay, um, so getting to the part of the talk where I talk about neural network correlation functions. So you can think of this kernel as a two point correlation function of the pre activations in, in each layer of the network. And so an infinite width. Um, this thing is just diagonal, so every neuron is decorrelated from every other neuron with a variance given by this kernel that depends on two data points, alpha 1 and alpha 2. Um, and there are nice recursion formulae that let you compute from layer to layer, given this object k in layer L, how do I get k at layer L plus 1? I do a two-dimensional Gaussian integral. Um, and I do it with respect to the activation function uh, that I choose, so whether or not I can do this integral analytically depends on my choice of activation function. Um, and then the same thing with, with this uh, this NPK object, there's a recurrent relation for that that depends on a bunch of Gaussian integrals of the activation functions and its derivatives with respect to this kernel that you already computed. And so it's an inhomogeneous uh, uh, recursion, so you have to solve these two things together. Um, and the choice that I made for the variance of the parameters in the beginning ensures what's known as criticality, which is that as I make my network deeper, 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 these things are never going to blow up exponentially or contract exponentially. Um, so I can think about taking networks with um, with, with larger small depth than these, um, uh, these objects are going to be well behaved. Okay, so at infinite width, um, the physics analog to the system is like a uh, like a free theory, and and uh, Jim and I have slightly different perspectives on this. One might be tempted to say it's a free quantum field theory, except there's no real quantum, and whether or not there's a field depends on how you think about uh, dividing up your space. But the point is. When you take the limit where n goes to infinity, you're doing a bunch of Gaussian integrals, um, and those are easy. Um, and so, at every step of gradient descent, you simply multiply your prediction error by this matrix that is frozen, um, and it does not change over time. And so, that's exactly what lets you predict where you end up from from where you started. And at every step, this is simply a linear transformation of your outputs. And so, if you take a Gaussian distribution and you transform it linearly, you get another Gaussian distribution with a different variance and different. And the fact you get a different mean is why you're actually learning something. You start at mean zero and you end up at a mean that is hopefully close to the answer that um, you're trying to learn. Things get annoyingly more complicated at finite width. Um, so there's a whole hierarchy of objects, one of which is frozen during training. And so you can start to compute things perturbatively in one over the width, uh, what happens during training. Um, but to get to this object, um, well, so one nice thing is that now um, the neural tangent kernel of NDK does update during training, so you start to learn features from your data. Um, and it would have been nice if you could have stopped here at four derivatives of the network, but unfortunately, this hierarchy only closes after six derivatives. This is a little bit annoying. It's a, like a very frustrating technical aspect to the NLP architecture, but, um, but there it is. Um, and all this stuff's worked out. Um, in um, these series of papers, especially this book by, uh, by Ken Roberts, who's been an IFI member for a while. Um, and what's nice is, so in principle, these update equations let you compute any correlation function you want. Um, all you have to do is compute a bunch of correlation functions of these objects over your ensemble of initializations, and that will tell you the dynamics during training, even at, uh, at finite width. Um, but in practice, things are a little bit uh, uh, annoying for, for a slightly different reason. Um, which is, let's think about how many numbers you have to store as a function of your training set size. Um, so if your training set has size nd, then these leading order 1 over n finite width statistics, every one of those correlation functions basically depends on four input parameters, or four, four data points. And so if you have 50,000 data points like you do in MNIST, the number of entries of those textures you have to store in order to compute the prediction is 10 to the 18, which I don't know because GPT-4 didn't release its models, but I assume that this is more parameters than even the leading edge of uh, uh, neural networks today. So this is not really practical. However, there's been some work suggesting that maybe if we're exploiting these scaling laws, maybe actually the infinite width prediction is all we need. So maybe we can just understand how these um, means and variances of the prediction scale with the size of the data set by just looking at the infinite width um, prediction. 
Um, and there's been a good amount of literature comparing the infinite width prediction to the predictions of, of, of finite width networks, but much of the literature focuses on very small training set sizes. Um, so we've actually this beautiful animation from Wikipedia that I you should, you should all play with because it's fun. So this is from the page on the neural tangent kernel. Um, so the task here is literally just fit a function of five points on the circle. Um, and so the band is going to show you the variance from this um, NDK gauge statistics, and the red is basically draws from an ensemble of neural networks. Um, and you see lots of things. So you fit all of the training points perfectly, but there's some spread in between, which lets the network both interpolate and extrapolate. Um, but if anybody ever told you, oh, neural networks are just doing high dimensional, you know, polynomial fitting. This clearly shows that's not what's going on, right? You're not fitting like a fifth order polynomial that blows up the endpoints. It really is trying to extrapolate. Um, however, this is just five points. Like, how do I make this kind of plot with 10,000 points, for example? Um, and we ran into some kind of curious technicalities that I hadn't seen elsewhere in the literature that I thought I'd be instructed to go through. Um, so uh, the first one is, okay, so if you want to know the prediction of an infinite width network, you just invert this matrix, this, this NDK. Um, but what if it's not invertible? Um, so it turns out that if your data is quote quote low dimensional, and I'm simply not being precise about that, but like trying to fit um, functions on a circle certainly uh, falls in that category, um, then it becomes rapidly nearly singular. Like the eigenvalue spectrum falls off very, very fast, and the determinant is a product of all these eigenvalues. And so just numerically, you're just never going to be able to invert this thing. Um, okay, that's not. A, an insurmountable problem because you can still apply the gradient descent steps one by one in order to get the prediction. It's just that some nice linear algebra result that involves inverting a matrix you might not have access to. Um, by the way, one, one reason you shouldn't be bothered by a singular NDK is like, imagine your training set had two copies of the same data point. Your NDK is going to be singular, but like obviously a real neural network is not going to care about that. Cool. Yeah. I know this is one of the key edge case stories about invertibility, and there's a lot of sort of blah, blah, blah in the literature about it. Yeah. When you're talking about it here concretely, do you mean are these? Sorry. Yeah. I'll ask the question yeah. in a short form. Yeah. In this case, are they floating point zeros or is it actually zero? No, no, it's floating point. It's floating. Like, it, like just, just, you know, the, 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 the determinant is 10 to the minus 270. Like, what are you going to do? Like, Good. yeah. So, um, okay. So then, then the next thing is so, so to compute the, um, the NDK, you have to iterate these recursion relations layer to layer. And every time you do that, you have to do some Gaussian integrals. If you have ND data points, you have to do O of ND squared of them. Um, so numerical integration is completely impractical. And so all that means basically is you should choose activation functions that play nicely with Gaussians. Um, so it turns out that by looking at old Russian math books, you can figure out integrals of ERF or powers of ERF or derivatives of ERF against Gaussians. Um, the formulas are so horrible, I'm not going to show them to you. But like, look, ERF and TANS are basically the same. Like, if you want to do analytic studies, why not use ERF activations? Um, another one of these things that like, hadn't really appreciated until we started actually trying to, uh, trying to do this. Um, and then another kind of curious fact is, you know, the fully, what does fully trained mean for an infinite width network? Well, you know, at the end of gradient descent, then you're supposed to do invert this NDK, but like if you can't invert it, then you just follow the gradient descent process all the way down. Okay, here is the training loss. It certainly looks like it's going to zero, but the test loss increases. Of course, we've all seen this phenomenon before. This is overfitting. And it was just interesting to me. I hadn't seen this before that overfitting also happens in the context of infinite width. And so when I'm trying to talk about fully trained predictions, I'm going to basically talk about doing early stopping even at the, um, in the infinite width limit, because that's what's going to correspond to what you would actually do with a, with a finite width network. I'm not sure how much this has been studied in the literature. When people talk about the generalization gap, they often talk about it at the end of training. I'm new to this literature. If some of you know about this, I'd love to have more discussions uh, after the talk. Um, Okay, so let me show you some toy examples. Um, so we did the endless classification problem, but regression to one hot labels using MSE loss. That's basically just so that the activation functions um, and, and the loss function are all um, are uh, are all nicely uh, differentiable and have a global minimum. Um, and what we find is that for the expected loss, we see nice power laws uh, as a function of training set size for both infinite width and finite width in this case with 30 networks. Um, and just by eye, like these are kind of similar, and that's nice. It means that at least for this problem, the infinite width um, limit seems to be fairly representative of what's going on with actual finite width networks. Um, but what was really surprising is that if you look at the relative variance, so basically the size of the error bars compared to the mean loss, that thing looks very, very flat with training set size. So if it's a power loss, a power law with index zero. Um, and in particular, 
the relative variance of the infinite width prediction is enormous. It's larger than one. But the relative variance of the finite width networks is very, very small. So this is good. And it's one thing that seems to be coming out of this um, series of experiments that finite width networks are reducing the ensemble variance, meaning that they are actually robust to, um, uh, to, uh, to a lot of these hyperparameter choices. Um, OK, so um, the, the very, very simplest thing you could do to try to understand where this flat uh, scaling law comes from is as follows. So you can write down, um, in the case where you could invert the MDK, um, which it turns out you can for, for n this because it must be sufficiently high dimensional in some sense. Um, if you write down the mean prediction and the variance um, of the fully trained prediction, it looks like this. So it's a bunch of major multiplications. So you take the NTK uh, between two training points, you invert that thing, and you multiply by the NTK between with one test and one training point. So I've colored one of these things. You can see all these objects here. And let's just like assume that you just make sure you have the random entries and all the entries scale with the size of the data set as follows. So I'm going to give some scaling exponents p, q, and r. And if the last term dominates, which there's no guarantee that it does, this thing is kind of like the square of this with an extra factor of k. And so then this relative variance and scale is just the scaling exponent for the kernel. Um, and if that scaling exponent is close to zero, that would mean you get these flat power loss for the relative variance. Um, and weirdly, that does seem to be what happens. Um, I don't have any good explanation for this yet. Except maybe you shouldn't be so surprised that like the kernel, which is kind of, kind of dot products of your data, shouldn't depend on the size of the training set because it's not supposed to get better as the data set gets bigger. The thing that's supposed to get better is the thing that lets you learn, which is the NTK inverse. And indeed, that's the thing that does have a non-trivial power law. So these are basically the mean entries of these matrices um, as a function of, of, of data set size. Um, and we did a bunch of experiments. We changed hyperparameters, the learning rate hyperparameters. We changed the, um, uh, the, 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 the depth. Um, and we see that these relative various power laws do seem to remain pretty flat. So this seems to be some kind of, I wouldn't go so far as to call it an invariance, but it's something that is worth investigating that might be specific to the structure of these, um, um, these MLPs. Okay, so then we try to apply this to a toy physics problem. And just, just disclaimer, like, this is not the way you should solve this problem. We are using a quote unquote physics data set as just like just like one would use MNIST. It's just some data set that you can get, you can do a regression problem on. So you know you have some simulation of calorimeter kits for charged ions, um, and you'd like to regress the energy of the true track from just the raw pattern of kits. Like obviously you should not do this with an MLP. Obviously many of you talked about this yesterday. There are much better ways of doing this problem. This is just a toy example to see if we say the same features on a data set that's drawn from physics. Um, Okay, so uh, spoiler alert, we do, which is kind of neat. Um, so in this case, it turns out that actually, so number one, the scaling laws for both the infinite width NTK and the finite width networks, they look, again, pretty parallel. Um, this time, your infinite width network does better. Um, again, I'm not sure there's any guarantee that it, um, you should do better or worse. It's very task dependent. Um, but we see the same thing when we look at the relative variance. The NTK is still variance dominated. The finite width network is bias dominated. The relative variance is much smaller. And once again, these power laws look very, very, very flat. And this is a case where we absolutely cannot invert the NTK. It's extremely singular. In some sense, like this data is intrinsically very low dimensional. Like there's not a lot of information contained in the raw pattern of hits. Like there's just one number you're trying to fit. You know, most of the energy is kind of clustered and um, uh, clustered along the track. Um, but you can still make these um, finite width and infinite width predictions, and it's neat that you see the same uh, kind of behavior here. Okay, um, so the preliminary conclusions, and so these are the same plots that I showed you, but now I'm plotting the variance as an error bar on top of the mean, and you really see visually what, I, what I'm talking about. You can barely see the error bars for finite width networks. Um, and so if one effect of having a finite width network away from the infinite width limit is you're reducing variance, that's great. Like, that's great news. It means that your systematic error for problems that you solve using MLPs should be robust to all kinds of hyperparameter choices. And in particular, if the relative variance is small, any individual network that you train is going to be well representative of the mean performance. You don't need to train a thousand networks to convince yourself that you're um, you're always landing on the same net. Yeah, uh, Jim, question. Something that sometimes people ask before they've thought in detail about what machine learning is doing is, oh, isn't the network always just finding the same function? Um, and the answer to that is no. But there's some sort of intuition that, the, you know, with, with things that are well learned, the basin of attraction should be narrow enough that the variance is small. I mean, I guess that's what you're seeing 
empirically here. But and it's then, finite with numbers that are doing it and not the infinite with ones. It, it, exactly, yeah. because the infinite with ones aren't doing any learning whatsoever, and so why should it be a narrow basin of attraction? Well, except that if you look at the mean loss for mness, um, actually, which way? Oh, sorry. The, the, yeah, it's for this power call, like the mean loss for the infinite with number is much better. So I don't know how to explain that along that wall. It's doing something. Like if your problem is close to a linear regression, infinite width is going to be just fine. And I have no good explanation for why the relative variance would be so large. But this is sort of one thing that we're planning to, to keep going. But this is a mean infinite width prediction. That's right. Not, that's right. That's right. Yeah. So it's still a very wide basin. It's, it's a very wide basin, but that. on average, you do better. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, and you'll explain this uh, narrow to severe of ours? Um, I would like to. We have not yet implemented the finite width. Prediction, I think that would be the, the nice thing to do. So I, I do not know how to compute the size of the error bars, but empirically it seems if you want to train a network on a very small training set size, the relative error should be the same as you scale up. Yeah. I mean, but again, that's not a it's not a proof. It's just a, it's an empirical thing that seems worthy of further investigation. Yeah. Yeah. I just want to make sure I understand relative error on the test loss. On the test loss, yeah. The training loss is always going to be functionally zero. Oh, so sorry, but on the, on, the, on the value of loss, not necessarily on the inferred values of parameters. Well, in this case, the loss is literally the bias away from the true energy value for the calibrator example. Oh. So in that case, that's what I mean by saying that like you want the relative variance to be small so that your systematic error on your calibrator, you know, calibration should be driven by the mean and not the variance. Yeah, I think you can just go back to the last slide that you've shown. Yeah. Uh, yeah, I was wondering, I mean, yeah, here's the result. It's like a finite group MLPs are always bias dominated. Um, isn't that sort of like a trivial result? Right. So if you have, I mean, if you start in the first phase and you're like in the biased regime with the MLP, um, and then you scale up the training set size, this isn't going to improve your bias, right? So what you should do instead is like increase the model capacity. Um, you mean increase the width? Fix the data set size and increase the width and see how the error bars change. Yeah, for example, I think in this case, it would be the more interesting th thing, I guess. Sure. I mean, so the, the fact that finite with networks are bias dominated, like, I, I mean, that fact might exist in literature. I, I hadn't seen it stated this way. Um, but one would like to understand this on as many axes as possible. Indeed, what is it about going toward the infinite width limit that drives the error bars up? I guess I would have expected the error bars to somehow scale with like one over n. That eventually, when you get to a very, very narrow network, your error bar should be larger, but it seems to go in the opposite direction. So, okay. Um, so, um, just in the last couple of slides, let me move on um, to a different but related uh, project and show you some preliminary results from that as well. Um, which is that everything so far was imagining you're fixing your data set. Um, but if you have some generative model of, uh, of your data, you can draw from that as many times as you want. And now there's a new source of error, which is just if you train the same network with the initialization frozen on different draws from your data distribution, you're going to get different answers. Um, and one toy example that you can play with this on is to learn the phase space distribution of the plumbers here. This is some nice analytic uh, distribution, some you know model of like a, a, a spherical galaxy. Um, and you're going to learn this distribution using um, using a normalizing flow. So now I'm stepping very far away from this like simple MLP with gradient descent limit, um, but just kind of empirically poking at this. Um, try to identify these different sources of, of uncertainty and, and physics problems. Um, you know, so here is your here's your distribution, spherically symmetric, and so it just depends on the magnitude of the velocity and the magnitude of the of the distance in the center. Um, and if you train a bunch of networks in two different ways, one of them is you freeze your training data, but you vary your initialization, so you fill your network with different parameters. Another one is that you freeze your initializations, but you vary the training data. So for some fixed training data size, you take different draws of that same um, uh, of that same size. Um, and you look now at the standard deviation of the loss measured as the KL divergence from the, the true distribution. Um, both these things follow very nice power laws. Um, but weirdly, and again, this is a bit surprising to us, that the initialization variance dominates over the, the data variance. Um, so this is not great. Um, you would prefer it be the opposite direction. Like the, you know, if you're you know looking at, for example, stellar data, you know, you don't get to draw from our galaxy more than there are stars in our galaxy. And so that's the kind of irreducible sorts of variance. And you like to make sure that your model uncertainty 
you know, the industrialization of your network is going to be especially smaller than that. Um, but actually, that does seem to be what happens for diabetes. And so what inspired this product was looking at a result by the, um, the Rutgers group uh, um, from uh, David Sheen and collaborators, where they're trying to extract the phase space distribution of stars in our galaxy from Gaia data by training a normalizing flow. Um, and they made this claim in their paper that we checked that indeed, for sufficiently large training set size, um, the initialization variance is smaller than the data variance. So now the relative order is flipped, um, which is kind of curious, and we're trying to figure out why. Um, and again, one like very simplistic answer um, might just be that um, there is substructure. That if you have a very smooth distribution, um, in some sense, like it's easier to fit, but then your basin of attraction is a little bit bigger. Um, but now, like, let's imagine throwing in some streams of stars. Like, this is literally like the stupidest possible <laughs> example of it. Like, just literally one stream is very narrow in velocity space and fixes some position. And then all of a sudden, now, as your training set size gets bigger and bigger, your data variance is larger. And this is sort of not terribly surprising. Like, the chance of you landing on some star in your in your data draw that lives in this very very uh, compressed uh, part of phase space is going to make the, um, the the variance induced by the, the data draw larger than the initialization. Um, but again, this might be sort of good news in disguise because you know in real life your your data is not the plumber sphere, um, and so complex data is complex enough such that like it makes the initialization variance of your network subdominant. Then again, that's great. We don't have to worry about it, and that would be the answer that, that, that we would want that would tell us that our, our results are robust to, to all these different choices about how you train these things. Um, okay, so let me maybe just leave you with some. Uh, so ideas for, for, for future work. Um, so one thing is that, you know, to the extent that this infinite width limit is representative of what a true finite width network does, can you determine your optimal learning rates for your weights and biases um, that minimize this relative uncertainty or minimize the, the, the mean loss, um, and then run a finite width network and get the right answer? Um, so I know that some of this has been investigated in the literature, but I'm not sure how much it exactly matches onto our context. Um, if we figure out how to improve the scaling with the training set size with these finite width corrections, then we can actually use these finite width gradient descent equations to figure out analytically what the variance is supposed to be. That was the original goal of this um, uh, of this project. Um, so we're just sort of taking a first step, but I think this is interesting to, to, to think about playing with. And then also there's been a lot of work done, um, especially by, by Chang and Pelavon, I think was also an IPI member, um, about variances in finite width and infinite width neural networks using this mu parameterization, which is a different choice of the large end scaling of the weights and biases. Um, I'd really like to understand how all the things that we've done relate to similar studies where we're using these parameterizations, or in those simulations, they're away from, um, from criticality as a way to increase variance in order to, to gain access to finite, um, or to infinite width uh, feature learning. Um, so I'm looking forward to more discussions with all of you with this, uh, this workshop, and happy to take more questions. Is there any questions? I have to ask my question again, but now the summer tutor. Yeah. Example. So um, the question is what the variance is, what the uncertainty is on. And yeah. Here was on the, again, I think you're showing the results in the loss, but there's yeah. a question of the variance on the inferred plumber radius. Ah, okay. We haven't looked at that yet. Okay. I think I, I'm curious whether when you're in this limit where you say, oh, I'm initialization dominated, yeah. it may just be that actually it's initialization dominated, the losses are varying, but actually the inferred value could be completely robust to those variations. Right. So I think this gets at something that I, that I didn't mention that like what we like to have is a quantitative measure of what is it about this distribution that makes you flip from this to this. Um, and so maybe it's something like, you know, the entropy of the distribution relative to a very simple one, right? The plumber sphere only has like, you know, like one parameter. Uh, but, you know, a distribution going to substructure has more parameters. And so, in some sense, the relative, you know, or, or you know, the, the KL divergence is going to be larger. So, maybe if the KL exceeds some threshold value, then, then it, it's related to what you're saying that, you know, that, that in the simpler distribution, it should be easier to extract precise values on the few parameters that characterize the distribution. But when it gets more complicated, that's when. Um, that's when the data variance starts dominating. And you should say, just for the second, what was the actual uh, learning task that you're trying to do? You are trying to, it, it's unsupervised learning of the distribution. So you, you, you're, so from the draw of the distribution, you're just trying to learn the full 60 basis. Yeah. Hey, I'm so I have a couple of questions. 
So you meant you showed this animation of empty caves hitting two point data points. And yeah. You said that uh, it's extrapolating and not just curve hitting. Yeah. Uh, but nicely, it looks to me like uh, the picture you showed is exactly what you would get from something like Gaussian process regression, which does not involve any neural networks. Yes. Right. So how is that not curve hitting? And I also have a second question, which is related to this example. Yeah. So you mentioned that there was some kind of uh, power correlation between the KL and the loss uh, for your normalizing flow, which uh, I guess I'm confused by because the KL is the loss for a normalizing flow. That's right. That's right. So yeah. how is there a correlation? It should be just like proportional. Right? So, um, sorry, you're talking about like this. Yes. Yeah. yeah. So, so th this is the this is the the standard deviation of the loss, right? So every network you train is going to have a different KL with respect to the true distribution. Oh, okay. So it's just, it's literally it's, it's a standard deviation of the of, of the loss or the loss of the KL. Okay. Um, and then to answer your first question, certainly infinite width networks are doing Gaussian process regression, mm -hmm. but um, a, a naive physicist who is not as well versed in statistics as this audience might associate curve fitting with like drawing a polynomial through points that blows up at the endpoints and. In my experience, people who haven't really thought a lot about neural networks are like, oh, it's only doing curve fitting like of that variety. So I think that animation just meant the point is not doing that kind of curve fitting, it's doing the kind of curve fitting you're talking about. Yeah. That, I mean, that's all. Yeah. 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 Maybe my definition of curve fitting kind of is more, uh, it's, it's bigger and kind of. It's like, probably like, the right one. Yeah. yeah, yeah. But so, yeah. <laughs> I guess I'm saying it's still curve fitting. So yeah. You know, people say, out of distribution things or extrapolating, and I don't think you're going to first actually do that. But I just wanted to kind of make yeah, that comment. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, can you just go to your last slide real quick? Um, this, I preface this, this is not an interesting question. I'm just trying to understand what your, um, how does this all relate to similar studies using UP and non critical edits? Yeah. The question is a very important one for science. In the NGK case, I know we know tons about uncertainty quantification. Yeah. I would have thought that the literature, the existing literature on feature learning, UP, whatever, pick your favorite, that they do a lot on this. Is it is it not really known how to think about optimal hyperparameters and uncertainty quantification? So, so I don't know, and I'm going to claim ignorance here. This is sort of related to what we talked about yesterday. Like, how, how does one trace in literature as a physicist coming in from the outside? But the favorite papers that you and I know do not address this issue, I think, is what you're saying. I do not believe so. Okay. But also, I don't believe that any physics analysis using neural networks is using UP. Not that I know of, yeah. Right, but maybe we should be. Maybe we should. Right, but, you know, and, and, and maybe this is, like, a justification for trying to do this. I mean, like, you know. I, I like it seems to have taken off in, in you know in the industry context maybe you know they, they know something we don't but yeah there, but, but there's not a clear paper that you would point to for a theoretical understanding and future learning regimes of uncertainty quantification I don't believe so we're attempting to sort of do that in the context that I understand but again those of you that know literature better I, I, I want to hear more yeah I don't know yeah that could be my yeah. thanks no one has that You know, one thing that just occurred to me like, since we talked yesterday about this coffee and coffee. Um, the NMPDF collaboration um, does actually, um, in their training, they use some Bayesian um, optimization of the hyperparameters and trying to extract the effect on the posterior by, like, you know, basically ruling out in, like, people like choosing hyperparameters. So it's not, it's not the theory um, paper that you're looking for. Yeah. But I think it's the, Coolest um, application that I know of. So yeah. at least there's one person who has thought about that. Stefan Laporte. Good. I mean, so so I, I I would believe that you could do this kind of thing in, in the in the Bayesian context. I'm not aware of this having been done in like the you know just the fully connected MLP context. And it'd be nice to know you know what the relations between those are. Yeah. So it's not the Bayesian network. It's the it's the Bayesian Bayesian optimization. Oh, I see. I see. It's the Bayesian in the. In the it, I guess it's some kind of data inference of like couple parameters and just okay. posterior estimation or whatever. Um, so it's not Bayesian network. Okay. Okay. I see. My fault. Yeah. Uh, these plots for the NPK that you showed, this was done for the uh, uh, 
a small activation function to it. Okay. Yes. Yes. So is it possible to apply also for the no small activation function? So good. So you can you can do all of this stuff for ReLU, and like it turns out that actually there are analytic formulas for um, these integrals, and so you might be worried that there's a derivative here. But actually, because you can integrate by parts for ReLU, you just manage to skate by. You can get an analytic formula for the recursion. The problem becomes if you ever want to do finite width. This perturbation theory breaks down for non-smooth affinations. Um, so with an eye towards wanting to do the finite with stuff, that's why we stuck with smooth ones. But yeah. More questions? There are no more questions. I think we've got time for them. Thank you.